sports fans, and welcome to another BBC Sports View programme. We have ten items again for you this evening, with a special treat, I think, for boxing fans, because at some moment during the next 30 minutes, we shall be going over to the Royal Albert Hall in London, where tonight there's boxing. Now, as soon as we've had news from the Albert Hall that one of the fights has reached what looks to be a decisive stage, then we shall, if necessary, interrupt the programme to go over there. Big news item number two tonight is a soccer transfer, which will be com uh, completed right here in the gymnasium. Uh, other personalities tonight include Len Hutton in an exclusive filmed interview direct from Adelaide, where, of course, the test match begins tomorrow. R.W.B. Robbins is here. Chris Chatterway, fresh from his South African trance, is with us. Ken Jones and Sheila Van Dam, who's only an hour or so ago, returned from the Monte Carlo rally. We'll also be going north to watch tonight's draw for the first round of the Rugby League Cup. Well, that's the lineup for tonight, and we begin with boxing. Now, a new British boxing champion was crowned this weekend. He is the featherweight from Ulster, Billy Spider Kelly. Now, our BBC Sports View camera team went to Belfast to see him win the title from Sammy McCarthy. McCarthy, he's the one with the broad stripe of his shorts, never seems to get going in his usual championship style. Though he's slightly the taller man and has the longer reach, he is unable to hit and hurt the Irishman. And no wonder they call Kelly Spider. Weaving in and out of McCarthy's guard, he has the Londoner baffled. McCarthy's best-looking punches sail harmlessly past Kelly, while the Irishman steps in and counter-punches. That's the pattern of this fight. An aggressive McCarthy missing with most of his punches, a clever Kelly countering time after time with blows that hurt and count. McCarthy is clearly puzzled. He has never met a fighter like this before. And by now, the Londoner's right hand, which carries his Sunday punch, is almost useless. Kelly, who has been on top all along, is inside of victory. And so Billy Kelly wins the dual title his father won in the same hall 16 years ago, the British and British Empire Featherweight Championship. McCarthy, boxing's happiest warrior, has been dethroned, and Belfast hails the new champion, Billy Kelly. Well, if Billy Kelly is the Sportsman of the Week, then I think undoubtedly the Sportswoman of the Week is Sheila Van Dam. Driving the car in which she won the Ladies' Cup at Monte Carlo, Miss Van Dam arrived back in Britain literally only a few hours ago. And she's very kindly come straight to Sports View to tell us about her victory. Raymond Baxter's with her now, so let's join them. Allow me, Sheila. Thank you, Raymond. And once again, congratulations on a magnificent motoring achievement. I don't know how you do it. The European Ladies' Rally Championship of 1954, and now this is the start of 1955. How did you manage to get back so quickly? I just flew in this afternoon. With Been a motor car? Oh, yes, with a motor car. I don't like walking. Well, when one motors as well as you do, why indeed walk? Well, now, we've, had, we've got a splendid excuse for not opening the bonnet tonight, as you can see. Sheila, would you be kind enough to tell us what all this magnificent silverware is? Yes, Raymond. The first one is the uh, plaque given to all the competitors who finished the rally. Yes, even we've got one of those. And the cocktail <laughs> shaker? Well, I really don't know, but it's a very useful thing to have. Precisely. And then, in the centre, the coupe de dame itself. That is right, yes. The first time that that's been in this country since 1932. That must make you very proud. Yes, Raymond, uh, I, and we are all very proud. And what about this really beautiful one here? Well, this is the European Championship. Mm -hmm. The uh, little girl? Well, that was given to me by the German Automobile Club before I left Munich. She must have a name. Oh, but of course, she's a little ray of sunshine, and I call her Sunbeam. Yes, we asked for that one. Well, now, Sheila, um, what are your most outstanding impressions of the rally, looking back on it? I think the fact that uh, three women were placed in the first 20. I was 11th, Madame Porchon was 16th, and Nancy Mitchell was 17th. We girls are rather proud of that. Yes, any cracks about lady drivers, please send a postcard direct to Miss Van Dam. Finally, how do you account for this continued success? Oh, teamwork. I have two wonderful co-drivers in Anne Hall and Francoise Clark. They are uh, wonderful, absolutely staunch supporters. I couldn't do without them, and I owe it greatly to them. Well, let's wish you every success for continued teamwork in 1955. And now, back to Peter Dimmock. Well done, Miss Van Dam. Now, Wales took a step nearer to winning rugby's triple crown 
when, as you saw if you were watching Saturday's outside broadcast, England were defeated by three points to nil. It was a very special occasion, though, for Ken Jones of Newport, because it was his 36th international. Now, at this moment, this most capped player in Wales is in front of our live outside broadcast camera in Cardiff, so let's meet Ken Jones, interviewed by G.V. Wynne Jones. Last Saturday at Cardiff Arms Park was quite a day for Ken Jones, in spite of the mud. Uh, what do you think about it, Ken? Well, it certainly was, Jeeves. It was the ninth occasion that I have played against England and the 36th occasion that I played for Wales. Well, does that mean you now hold 36 caps? Well, not quite. I have uh, played for Wales on 36 occasions, but uh, unfortunately I only have one cap, as you see. Well, that's normal, Ken. How many times you play for your country, you get one cap. Yes, only. that's quite true. Only one. Well, now, last Saturday in the mud, I noticed that quite a lot of kicks were directed towards your wing. Obviously, everyone was very keen that you should score. Yes, uh, I was wanting to score myself, too, because uh, I only need two more tries to gain a new record of tries for Wales. Well, now, we noticed that uh, yesterday you were chosen for the 37th time to play for Wales against Scotland at Murrayfield the week on Saturday, and I'm quite sure you'll be after those two tries there. Well, Murrayfield has certainly been a very happy hunting ground as far as I've been concerned, and so a week on Saturday I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Well, now, Ken, if you look behind you, you'll see a silhouette of a familiar scene. Well, it's certainly uh, uh, an unusual angle, but it brings back very pleasant memories of Cardiff Arms Park. Memories not only for me, but for many hundreds of thousands of Welsh rugby followers. Two memories I have in particular. Uh, one last year when uh, Clem Thomas made the try for me against the All Blacks, and the other occasion, of course, was last Saturday. Well, now, with those very modest remarks, I think it's appropriate with the hope that Ken Jones will break still more records in the future that we hand back to Peter Dimmock in the studio. Well, from rugby union to rugby league football. Now, it's a long time yet, perhaps, until April the 30th, the date of the Rugby League Cup final at Wembley. But tonight, the first step towards it is being taken in Manchester. The draw for the first round of the Rugby League Cup is about to begin, so let's watch it happen and go now north again to Manchester this time. Bellevue, our special board, waits to show you the 32 teams playing in the 16 first round matches on February the 12th. And now onto the platform come the Rugby League officials to make the draw. First, Mr. Jim Alroy, Vice Chairman. In the middle, Mr. Jim Hilton, Chairman. And next to him, Mr. Bill Fallowfield, Secretary of the Rugby League Council. Number 20. Oldham. 29. Wigan. Oldham against Wigan. Number 6. Number Bramley. 11. Halifax, Bramley against Halifax. Number 21. Rochdale Hornets. Number 25. Wakefield Trinity, Rochdale Hornets against Wakefield Trinity. Number 30. Workington Town. Number 32. Winners of qualifying rounds. Workington Town against winners of qualifying rounds. Number 18. Lee. Number nine. Doncaster. Lee is Doncaster. Number 14. Hulkingston Rovers. Number 31. York. Hulkingston Rovers against York. Number 24. Swinton. Number 13. Hull. Swinton against Hull. Number 17. Leeds. Number 12. Huddersfield. Leeds against Huddersfield. Number 15. Hunslet. Number 27. Whitehaven. Num Hunslet against Whitehaven. Number 19. Liverpool City. 28. Widnes. Liverpool City against Widnes. Number 10. Featherstone Rovers. Number 3. Bellevue Rangers. Featherstone Rovers against Bellevue Rangers. Number 22. Salford. Number 7. Castleford. Salford against Castleford. Number 16. Keithley. Number 4. Blackpool Borough. Keithley against Blackpool Borough. Number 8. Dewsbury. Number 1. Barrow. Dewsbury against Barrow. Number 2. Batley, number 23. St. Helens, Batley against St. Helens. Number 5. 
Bradford Northern, number 26. Warrington, Bradford Northern against Warrington. And there is the draw complete. If we just have time to look at it on the way up. There's the draw of the first round on the 12th of February. Now I'll say goodbye from Bellevue and back to Sportsview Desk in London. Well, I bet there's bound to be a lot of discussion about the prospects for some of those matches. They're due, by the way, to be played on the 12th of February. Now, for soccer fans, next Saturday sees the fourth round ties for the FA Cup. Some great and exciting matches are in prospect all over the country. And tonight, the Sportsview film camera team, well, they're rather sticking their necks out because I think everyone has his or her fancy for the Wembley final. But tonight, we're going to tell you ours. This, then, is our forecast of the 1955 Wembley finalists. It's arrival by car for the key man of Preston, Tom Finney. He drives to the Deepdale ground most mornings from hospital, where he is still being treated for sciatica. But Finney, one of soccer's most modest personalities, says that he is no longer troubled by the injury, and that for the first time in months, he is now able to go all out. Being on the losing side in last year's cup final has made Tom Finney more determined than ever to get that sought-after medal this season. Widely fancied, along with Preston, for soccer showpiece, are the men of Merseyside, Everton. The Tommy men, as they are known, have a great record this season. The key man behind their attack is fair-haired centre-forward Dave Hickson. For months now, he has been hitting the goals and the headlines. And Everton's manager, Cliff Britton, scotches all the talk about Hickson leaving. But Dave Hickson, of the goal-scorching feet, is the man who can help take Everton to that peak of the soccer season, the cup final. Well, I hope I don't have to come here next week and apologise to the followers of Sunderland, maybe, and, uh, say, Liverpool. In fact, all the other 28 clubs. But there you are, it's anyone's guess, but the cup final's not so very far away. Now for some more soccer news that's being made right at this very moment, a transfer. Now, the player is Brentford inside forward Billy Dare. His new club is West Ham. Now, you'll remember that it was Billy Dare's goal that won Brentford their fourth-round cup replay last week. Now, he's about to sign for second division West Ham, and his new manager, Mr. Ted Finton, is here to watch him sign on. So let's go into the gymnasium and see the transfer. Uh, now, Billy, we've seemed to have ironed out all our difficulties, and I would like you to sign these three contracts for West Ham Football Club. Would you sign just there? He gets ten pounds for this, Mr. Finton. He does, Peter, yes. And uh, I shall give it to him in one moment. Well, there's no spoof about this. And here come the ten pounds, I believe. Yes. I thought the BBC was the only place who had lots of forms, but still. Thank you, Billy. Uh, now I count these here. One, two, Well, now, while Mr. Fenton's counting, four, I think we can five, trust him, Mr. Dare. Six, Will you be playing seven. for West Ham on Saturday? Uh, no, I shan't be uh, playing for West Ham, but uh, I shall be watching my new club mm -hmm. play uh, Portsmouth in a friendly at Upton Park. Getting an idea. And yes. I see you've been pretty smartish off the mark. That's the West Ham badge, isn't it? Yes, I have. Well, congratulations with your new team. Thank you, and thank you Mr. Fenton. Thank you, Peter. And we shall look forward to seeing you at West Ham soon. Later. Thank you very Goodbye. much. Uh, let's well, get on with the program. Thank you. <laughs> There's your money, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I will just get these together and... Uh, then we're going to move on. Let's talk of the cricket, because in a few hours' time, Len Hutton and his men will begin playing the critical fourth test match against Australia. Now, RWB Robbins is here again to discuss the prospects with Brian Johnston, but before that, let's hear from Len Hutton himself in Adelaide in this exclusive BBC Sports View filmed interview with E. W. Swanson. Would you like to say something about the development of some of the? younger players who had a good deal to do with the victories at Melbourne and Sydney? Yes, one or two of them, uh, particularly uh, Tyson, uh, Cowdery and Peter May, their improvement has been most noticeable since we arrived in Australia in October. Uh, Tyson, who uh, shortened his run uh, considerably, has improved his direction uh, really beyond uh, my expectations. And uh, he is, I feel, uh, a real danger and, uh, in the future he's going to be a great help to England. Uh, Peter May has developed as I thought he would on these good wickets. He now hits the ball very hard and uh, there we have a young cricketer uh, uh, the like I think that uh, I, see, I hadn't seen in England for many many years. And Colin Cowdery he has improved considerably too. He is a very promising uh, uh, player. He's uh, improved beyond really uh, my 
most expectations since we arrived in Australia. Uh, stays in the stroll extremely well, and of course, the wicket keeping of Gottfried has been most outstanding. He has taken some really magnificent catches, which of course are a great help to these fast bowlers. But the spirit of the side generally, uh, all the time throughout the tour, has been extremely good. Uh, I, of course, am uh, very sorry indeed that one or two players have not had the opportunity that they might have had, but then this usually happens with touring teams when you have 16, 17 or 18 players. But perhaps before the tour ends, we may see some form from one or two who have not had very much news so far. One point more, Lynn. I'm sure there are very many thousands who want only one thing less than another English victory, and that's for you to get 100 here at Adelaide. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, about two months ago after the Sydney match against New South Wales, I felt my concentration was going, and I felt I knew needed a break from cricket. But then, with three test matches ahead, the first one, the second, and the third, and until now, I really haven't been able to relax from cricket after some 14 months of continuous play. Uh, Adelaide is a lucky ground for me. I feel I'll do well. I'm feeling fitter now than I did in the last test match, and I look forward, personally, to making at least a couple of hundreds. Well done. Well, thank you, and let's hope that you do well and that the side does well as well. Thank you very much. Phew, at least a couple of hundred. He sounds pretty optimistic, doesn't he? Uh, yes, I love confidence, but <laughs> I've settled for 150 in both innings. Mm -hmm. About 70 from Edrich. I'd like to see 100 from Compton. And incidentally, I think this is a, a test for Dennis because he's played in the last 10 test matches he's played against Australia. Mm -hmm. He's only averaged about 20, and uh, it's about time, really, that he showed that what a great player he really is on great occasions. He's got a good wicket to do it on, hasn't he? Oh, yes, it's, it's more akin to Lords than any other wicket I know. Uh, Lords without the slope. Mm. I mean, the ball will turn, but it's a lovely wicket and a lovely pace, and people who play off their back foot are better performers on this sort of wicket than on the Sydney and Melbourne wickets. Tyson and Stale will have a pretty tough time, especially in view of the heat, won't they? They'll have a very tough time because the heat is, it's very, very hot there, but not like Brisbane. It's, it's not a, a, a damp heat. It's mm. a dry heat, but it's extremely hot, yes. Now, Lindwell not playing for Australia. How do you assess that from the English point of view? <laughs> Whoever thought of Morris replacing Lindwall, so in the test side, but uh, actually I think the Australians have had a bit of luck. Mm. I wouldn't have said so at Brisbane. I wouldn't have said it at Melbourne or Sydney, but I think at Adelaide, the power of Lindwall is a great fast bowler is reduced by the conditions under which you'll bowl there and the great weakness of Australian cricket at the moment is their batting and I can remember Arthur Morris in 1950 making 206 not out there and he loves the Adelaide wicket and he's a great player on it and I think he's bound to play. What about the toss? Are we to win it? I hope we win it, yes, because it's a very important thing uh, on the Adelaide wicket uh, mm. uh, because uh, of the fact that the wicket does crumble and they are better equipped for spin bowling, I think, than we are. We don't want to bet the fourth inning time. And finally, Robbie, your forecast. What about it? I think it'll be a draw, myself. You do? <laughs> yes, I, uh, the last six test matches played at, at uh, Adelaide have gone six or more days, and I think that the bowling has been reduced in power because of the type of wicket, and I personally think it'll be a draw. I would very much like to win the toss. I want to turn the wireless on tomorrow morning and quick keep my fingers crossed and find that we're 150 for one with an hour and 40 minutes to go. I put my lucky tie on during the day and hope that we, we either get a draw or win. What is the lucky tie? Well, I can't tell you that because I feel the luck may go, <laughs> I tell you. All right, well, nice to meet you next week. You'll yeah. find out what yeah. it is. Yeah. Thank you very much, Robbie. Well, now, I hope Mr. Robbins is wrong, but we shall know on the live programme at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. Now, continuing our preview of sporting events to come, we look in on ice hockey. Now, the American national ice hockey team arrive in London next Monday on their way to the World Championships in Germany. In a special uh, report flown to us from Boston, we've taken a look at some of the American team uh, in action before they came over here. Fourteen players have been brought together at Boston for some special practice matches. Their target is the world title held by Russia. And the Americans, who were world and Olympic runners-up two years ago, say that this is the strongest team they've ever sent to Europe. 
here you are, Mr. Glenny, and welcome to to Sports Fuel. Now, we've seen that very hurried and quick glimpse of the American team, but I believe you played against one of them before, didn't you? I played against uh, the present captain, Rube Yorkman, mm -hmm. 1952. And what sort of a team do you think they'll be? Well, if they're up to his standard, they should be contenders for the world championships in Germany. Well, uh, reading in the papers uh, this morning, I see that, that Harringay alleged to have had a bit of a fight on the ice last night. Is that true? <laughs> well, in a game as fast as ours, uh, Peter, um, tempers do get frayed, mm -hmm. but uh, the bad point about it is the press do seem to want to exaggerate the incidents rather than the actual play of the game itself. Yes, I, I can well understand that. Now, may I just be, uh, ask you a personal question? You wear contact lenses, I believe. I do. I, I have worn them for about three years now, playing. Do you find it affects your game at all? Well, I hope it helps it. <laughs> I'm rather short-sighted. Uh -huh. But, I mean, uh, before you wore glasses and they were thinly knocked off. Oh, yes. People used to brush up against me and knock the glasses off, and I'd have trouble finding them on the ice. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Glenny, for coming to Sports View. May we wish you the very best of luck on Wednesday uh, against the American side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, now, the Americans, of course, will be playing an English national side at Southampton on Tuesday, and then the following night, that's February the 2nd, they'll be playing Harringay races at Harringay. Races, incidentally, were winners of the Autumn Cup, so they'll probably give the Americans a, a very tough match, I should think. And uh, Bill Glenny certainly seems to think so. Well, now, big-time boxing is also on the sports bill next week. This time, it's Nottingham's turn at the Ice Stadium there on Monday. Those two great cruiserweights, uh, Yolandi Pompey and Bobby Dawson, meet in a return match. Our film cameras have been out to see the two boxers preparing for the fights to come. Yolande Pompey, the cruiserweight from Trinidad, has been queuing up at Brighton. It's just a year since Pompey slipped from his near world championship perch. The man who toppled him was Bobby Dawson. And now Dawson, an American who arrived in Britain only this week, meet Pompey again at the same place, Nottingham. The winner steps back into the top world rankings and may even win a tilt at the world cruiserweight crown. Well, now for our last personality tonight. Uh, we have the man that you chose as your BBC Television Sports View Personality of the Year, Chris Chadway. Since then, of course, he's won himself many new fans in South Africa, where he won all his races. Well, welcome back to Sports View, Mr. Chadway. I think the first thing that we'd all like to know is, did the high altitude, which we always hear affect some of the boxers we've just been looking at, did it affect your running in Johannesburg? Um, well, it, it did, yes, a lot. Um, I, I did a time of 14.39 which is about 70 seconds slower than I have done. And really, it was very hard work indeed. I, th I think that you do get used to it, you stay there. I like to think that the other runners weren't quite as affected as I was. But for me, it made a big difference. Well, now, coming to more immediate things, is it true that you'll not be running again until May? Um, no, I, d I don't think I shall, no. The, the season in England doesn't really start till May, and I, d I don't intend to, to uh, go abroad for any more racing, I don't think. But uh, what, what, are your, um, what, what are your objectives? What are your, your first objectives? Um, well, I, I suppose the first British Games, which is at the end of May at, at Whitson, will be the first big meeting that I shall run in. And I think of um, concentrating more on the mile and the two miles earlier in the season and perhaps the 5,000 meters again later. Well, now that the, the three A's are going to send a team to Russia in September, do you think that you'll be able to, to beat uh, Kutz again? Well, that's a, that is a leading question, isn't it? Yes, yes. I don't know quite what I would be expected to answer to that. But um, I, I, I look forward to meeting him again. I, th I think that it'll be a different story, on a, um, not on one's home ground. I think that does make a bit of difference. <laughs> well, now, uh, finally, I think uh, I, I'd like to wish you a very happy birthday. I think it's your birthday on Monday, isn't it? How clever of you. Yes, it is, yes. Yes. Well, well, may we wish you a very happy birthday and, and a particularly happy and successful year. And one last thing, uh, have the South Africans got any really strong runners to come over here? Um, well, none at the moment, I would say, who are in world class. Except, well, one or two fairly good sprinters, but, but a number of, of young runners who I wouldn't be surprised to see do very well in the future. Well, we're going to look forward very much to watching you over here. Thank you, Mr. Chatterway, very much. And once again, good luck. And now, everyone, I think the time has come for our quick visit to the Albert Hall. And the most extraordinary thing has happened there. Two fights have ended very early. And so we're going to go over, and I think we may get a glimpse of the fight between Ron Barton and Arthur Howard. But to tell us more about it, let's join Eamon Andrews at the ringside. Well, the boy we came over to see here at the Albert Hall was too quick for us. That was Henry Cooper, 
who won 50% of the Cooper Twins, who decided not to wait for Sports View because he knocked out Colin Strauch of South Africa in the first round. It was a real humdinger of a first round, too. And uh, although Strauch looked dangerous, he was swinging wildly. And Cooper's old amateur experience and his coolness paid off dividends. He just stepped back and let Strauch have it. Put him down once, put him down twice. And that was the end of it. With about seven or eight seconds to go in that first round, Henry Cooper has... He has won another, another professional scrap. I'm sorry we got distracted there. We're looking at the moment. We're lucky enough to come over, of course, and try and, if we can, catch at least the opening round of the top of the bill here tonight, which is Arthur Howard, Ron Barton. We're just looking now at the Ron Barton corner. Ron Barton, the new sensation in British boxing. Light heavyweight. There are great hopes for him, and he looks very cool and very tough in his resplendent dressing gown. They've rather been caught out here tonight. Uh, not that it would seem so, but not only did Cooper not lose in the first round, but the ladies, next contest lasted one round only two. The main event of the evening. MC in the center of the ring now is Johnny Best Jr. from Liverpool, that flourishing boxing town where his father is a famous promoter. This round. is a very vital contest for Ron Barton, the West Ham light heavyweight. It, the contest already been twice postponed because Barton got a cold. And now he takes a cheer from the crowd as he's introduced. And the other side is Arthur Howard of Islington. Arthur Howard of Islington, who's in a dicky position as far as his professional boxing career is concerned. Unlike Barton, Howard has lost uh, some contests and notably one to Albert Finch, and he's got to win here against Barton if he's to go on. He's got a famous manager, Al Phillips, well known in the boxing world himself, a famous featherweight fighter. And he, he is quite confident, of course, as all managers must be, and Arthur, Arthur Howard is going to win. So too is manager Alfred Bogus of Ron Barton and this is the fight that has packed the Albert Hall here tonight. Referee Eugene Henderson, famous referee too, having the usual last words with these tall, tough, curly-headed young men. They're both very good looking for boxers and when we get a close look at them, if we've got any lady viewers to sports view, I'm sure they'll set many a hard turning over. It's a scheduled ten three-minute round contest and we're ready for this first round which you should just about get in and now the referee Henderson there is rubbing the face of power that's because his seconds have possibly put on too much Vaseline too much grease uh, a great deal of that is not allowed because uh, the glove of the opponent slides off but just to show no favors he's having a look too at Ron Barton and saying that he too is all clear cut and dried and we're ready for round one what we can take of it we'll carry on here in the Light striped trunks is Howard. Howard coming straight in, determined to put Barton off his. Light stripe is Howard. Barton very cool. It'll take a lot of rushing to put Barton to his normal, steady, straight, orthodox function. Howard here trying to steal the initiative by crashing in on his man and put him off whatever set plan he had. And as this fight starts, and reminding you again that the man we came over to see, Henry Cooper, knocked out his, his opponent in the first round, who say goodbye from the Albert Hall. And at that dramatic point, we come to the end of sports. Of course, you'll be able to see some more boxing, some very important amateur boxing in a few minutes from Scotland. So that's all from Sports View. We'll be back again next Thursday at 8.30 with more news of cricket, soccer, rugby, boxing and cycling. So until a week tonight, good sports viewing. Good night, everyone, and thank you for joining us.